How can veterans maximize the benefits of the GI Bill? How can they get a no money down mortgage? Where can veterans get a free meal and other discounts on Veterans Day? We'll answer these questions and more on this, the very first episode of the Dole Roller Podcast. Welcome to the Dole Roller Podcast, where the best thing money can buy is financial freedom. We help you make more, spend less, and invest the rest. And now your host, Rob Berger. Hey, everybody. Hey, whether you're just starting out, struggling under a mountain of debt, or well on your way to financial freedom, the goal of this podcast is to help you take your finances to the next level. I'm uh, really excited to be launching this uh, podcast. For those that have read my blog, uh, doughroller.net, regularly, you know I've been blogging uh, almost daily since 2007 about everything related to finance, uh, investing, money management, debt, retirement planning, insurance, mortgages, uh, and it's been an exciting uh, journey. I've enjoyed it a lot. I've met a lot of people, uh, but have wanted to launch a podcast for some time now just to to give me a different way to reach out to folks who, you know, are struggling with their finances or perhaps are just starting out and, and don't want to mess up, maybe maybe don't want to make th- some of the mistakes that they have uh, seen their parents or others make, um, or maybe for folks that are nearing retirement and are concerned about whether they're going to have enough. I'll tell you, I get a lot of emails from folks in their 50s and 60s wanting to know what can they do. They haven't saved as much as they would have liked to, and they're, and they're, they're scared. So um, the podcast will give me sort of a, a new way to reach out to folks and to interact with folks, and um, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And on, on this, the first episode, uh, we're going to dedicate this to veterans. Uh, Monday is Veterans Day. And uh, so this is a special episode focused, you know, on the men and women who have served our country in the armed forces. And uh, I'm happy to have uh, Ryan Ganahl on the show. Ryan uh, served in the Air Force uh, for about six or seven years, and now he runs a website called The Military Wallet. And uh, I've known Ryan since, oh, I would say about 2007 or 2008. And uh, so he'll be on the show to talk to us about the various benefits that uh, are available to veterans and uh, where they can get more information about those benefits. He'll be on the show in just uh, in just a little bit. Uh, before we get to Ryan, though, I wanted to cover uh, two things. First, to give you sort of a little bit about what this, how this podcast is going to work in the coming weeks and months and years, what you can expect from it. And then wanted to just share a little bit about my own financial journey so you get to a sense, a little bit better sense as to who I am and what my perspectives are. I mean, one thing I've, one thing I've learned from blogging about personal finance is that there are a lot of different views and opinions on how you should handle and manage your money. And uh, I'm, I guess, pretty set in my, my, my views and how I think uh, uh, folks should handle money. But that's just my perspective. And uh, I think a little bit of background on me will kind of give you a sense of that. So uh, first, the podcast. So I, I have a lot of different things planned for the podcast. Um, we're, obviously, interviews are going to be a, a big part of it because, you know, there are a lot of folks out there with a lot of expertise that I think can, can help us. Uh, Ryan today is a good example, but uh, in an upcoming uh, podcast, I've got the uh, the credit expert from FICO, Tom Quinn. He'll be on the show, and um, and we're going to have experts on everything from health insurance to mortgages to investing uh, to retirement. Pretty much any area of personal finance and investing, we'll eventually have an expert on the show to help us understand and learn and and to better manage our money in that particular uh, area. So the interviews will be a big part of the podcast. I'm also going to talk about uh, current news, particularly as it can help us um, improve our finances, uh, news we can use, so to speak. And uh, there's a lot, you know, I mean, we could, I could probably dedicate the entire show to news. I mean, everything you think about now, what's going on, everything from Obamacare to the uh, Twitter IPO, which can, um, <laughs> that could be a whole episode on how to invest, or I think in the case of folks that have bought Twitter, how not to invest, but that's a whole other story. But we'll cover news items, and we'll cover um, tips, and I'm going to uh, share a lot of resources. You know, as a blogger, I get emails from a lot of um, new websites that have interesting tools and resources that can help us with our finances, and um, and I, I, I run across a lot of, of, of resources and tools, and um, it's frankly far more than I could blog about. I mean, I could, it's just overwhelming sometimes, but uh, the podcast will give me an opportunity to share some of those resources uh, with you, and, 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 and we'll do that. 
And, uh, and so that's what I have in mind for the podcast. Um, it'll be a little different uh, every episode. Uh, I'm not going to get into a rut and just have the same routine. Uh, I'm going to mix it up. And um, the goal is to help you uh, achieve financial freedom, help you take that next step wherever you happen to be. Um, and uh, so that's the goal. That's kind of the lens that I look through to decide what's going to be on the show and what I'm going to include. And, um, and to that end, I'll also be answering reader questions. I get a ton of questions in, from email, uh, from uh, folks leaving comments on my blog, and I'll be sharing those questions with you um, and, um, and answering those questions as best I can. So that's what the podcast is going to look like. Um, and then for this first podcast, I just wanted to share a little bit about my own financial journey because uh, I've seen I kind of I've kind of seen everything. I've 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 lived uh, at times when we had very very little, um, and um, today I think I've achieved we've achieved at least my view of financial freedom. We you know we still my wife and I both still work for a living, but um, we've managed our finances in a way that we're not uh, worried about you know paying the bills next month. And um, for me, it started, you know, as a, as a kid, but I had a, my, my parents divorced and both remarried. And so and both my father and my stepfather owned businesses. And so at a very young age, I got a glimpse into the business world and it, I worked at both of their businesses. My father uh, had a, a, a company that sold jewelry wholesale. So he sold jewelry to um, uh, um, jewelry stores in central Ohio. And, but he also um, sold posters like to Kmart. It was an odd business. And so in the front of his warehouse, he had gold and diamonds and safes and all these sorts of things. And in the back, it was a big uh, warehouse with just rows and rows and rows of posters. And if you've ever been to a, a Kmart or Target and you've bought a poster, you know how they, the posters are in the sort of plastic sleeve and then they have a little sticker on one end that tells you what the poster is? Well, that was my job. So I rolled posters for, for during the summer. I'd roll posters and stick them in those plastic tubes, and I would I would roll what was called flock posters. So if you're old enough to remember those, you know all that black velvety stuff on the posters. And when you roll flock posters, the 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 the, the flock, the black stuff, gets all over you. So I'd come out of a day of working in my dad's warehouse, just covered from head to toe. It looked like it was soot, and um, that's how I spent my summers with my father. And he'd pay me minimum wage, and I loved it. And uh, my stepfather had a very different kind of business. He um, uh, was a, a fisherman. He loved bass fishing, tournaments, the speedboat, everything. And um, so he opened a tackle store, tackle and archery. And so I worked the summers at that store. I don't think I got paid, actually, as I think back on that. Um, uh, but it was a good experience dealing with customers and learning the merchandise and um, uh, just seeing how a retail operation runs. Uh, the not so good news was that he that he opened the store in the late 70s, and if you're old enough to remember the economy in the late 70s and early 80s, you know that it wasn't um, a very good time. Interest rates were high. You know, it's funny to see people talk about mortgage rates when they they get bump up to four and a half percent, and they start to get nervous. And I think, well, you know, I can remember when interest rates were 15 percent for mortgages, um, and the economy wasn't doing well, and the business failed. And I remember vividly my mom and, and stepfather sitting me down in our home and telling me we were gonna we were gonna move out. We we were gonna lose the home to foreclosure. And I didn't I didn't really understand then what a foreclosure was. I just knew that someone was gonna take our home from us. And I think that probably had a pretty big impact on me and how I handle finances today. That was a pretty scary time for a kid. Uh, I suppose the good news is we ended up not losing our home, but we went through a number of years where we had very, very little money. Um, and uh, it was a difficult time. And when I fast forward to, to finishing college, uh, I finished college with a lot of debt, a lot of school loans. And I was married then. My wife, um, as soon as I finished school, she went to graduate school and graduated with a master's in um, counseling. And so by the time she finished school, we probably had $75,000 in school loans, and we had no savings. Uh, and I remember then thinking, you know, I'm not necessarily the best with money, but I'm not going to repeat what I went through as a kid with finances. And so, you know, we made a lot of mistakes along the way. We had, like probably most people, we had credit card debt. Uh, you know, we borrowed to buy our cars, and we probably spent money we shouldn't have spent. And so for a while, I th we probably went deeper into the hole. 
but it was never more than we could handle. And during that whole time, as I was starting out in my career, um, and then we had children, we were saving. I started saving in a 401k. I started saving um, outside of retirement. And it was just step by step. It wasn't something that happened overnight, but eventually we paid off our car loans and eventually we paid off our credit card debt and got to a point where our only debt was our mortgage and that we could save some money. And we, you know, we're still working and working hard, but we got to a point where you know, we were not worried about paying the mortgage next month. And if uh, one of us were to lose our job, you know, it's not going to be a, wouldn't be a good, a good experience, but we'd be fine. And I think one thing that that whole process taught me was that achieving financial freedom, you know, just doesn't happen overnight. And, and you, you, in some sense, you don't ever really achieve it. You just get a little more comfortable and a little more comfortable, and it's step by step. And there's nothing magical to it. You know, there's no shortcuts. Um, I had a friend send me an email uh, the other day, and it was a link to some guy. I, I don't even remember his name, but he was talking about the Bible money code. Apparently, there's some secret code in the Bible. Um, and uh, uh, about how you can make, he said, up to 100% in six to nine months. And I just I cringed when I saw that. And I thought, you know, the sad thing about that is there are people that actually believe you can sort of get rich quick, and they go down that path, and they, they, they regret it. The, the truth is financial freedom comes month by month, week by week, little by little. Um, and that's, that was our experience. And so I've kind of seen the whole spectrum of uh, of finances, from from having no money at all and almost losing a home, to you know being okay, being, being comfortable, and uh, and that's my hope for all of you. And that kind of gives you a sense as to how I see money. Um, you certainly won't hear about get rich quick schemes here. I'm not going to tell you that it's you, you know that things are going to happen quickly. If you're in a mountain of debt, it's going to take you time. Uh, and it's going to take uh, patience, and it's going to take perseverance, and that's you know that's just the way it is. But I firmly believe that everyone can do it, and uh, that goal of this podcast is to help you do it. And uh, so that's the what what you can expect from the podcast. That's a little bit um, about me. And uh, so with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, turn to the interview with Ryan. You'll hear from Ryan in just a minute. Uh, I've known Ryan, as I said, for about seven, six or seven years. He, he runs a blog called CashMoneyLife.com. And, uh, of course, he's, he's a veteran. He started the military wallet in, I think, 2008. And it's a, it's, you think of it as a, a personal finance site for folks in the military and folks, and, and, and folks that uh, were in the military. Um, he, he shares his experience um, and it's a it's a wonderful website. If you're in the military, or if you know someone is, or you've, you're a veteran, I highly recommend it. And he's going to share with us today um, some great tips on the benefits that are available uh, to veterans. Hey, Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Rob. I appreciate you taking the time. You know, as I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, you and I we've known each other. Is it since two thousand and eight? Yeah, we've been uh, either 2007 or 2008, yeah. Yeah, we both started blogging about the same time. You started at Cash Money Life, and, uh, and then you started the Military Wallet. When did, you, when did you actually start the Military Wallet? I started it, it was actually right around 2008. I started Cash Money Life first, and I had a few military money topics on that site, but then I realized it needed its own, um, its own home on the web, so I broke it off into another site, and I've been running both ever since. Right, and and I know you served. It was in the Air Force, right? Yes. Can you just kind of I don't know, give us a, you know, uh, your thoughts on on serving in the Air Force and what kind of experience it was for you? You know, it was the time of my life. Um, I was uh, I did a year of college, and I just found myself bored with school. And the more I looked into options, I just decided I wanted to have an adventure. So I enlisted in the Air Force. I served six and a half years. And in that time, I, I certainly had my adventure. My first duty assignment was RAF Lakenheath, which is about an hour and 15 minutes northeast of London. So I got to live in England for a couple of years. I traveled extensively through Europe. Um, I was stationed in West Texas for a while. And in between, I got to travel to about 30 or 35 different countries uh, wow. in parts of five continents. 
Uh, got my degree while I was in the Air Force, and when I got out, I um, I married my wife, who I met in the Air Force, and you know, it's kind of it's really been the launching pad for where I am today. Uh, that's great. And what, when when did you when did you leave the service? I got out in early two thousand six. And and by the time you got out, you already had your bachelor your bachelor's. Yes. And that that's fantastic. Did did you do you have family that served in the in the in the Air Force as well? Uh, actually, my grandfather did. Uh, he, he had re- long retired by the time I had joined. Uh, um, my father didn't serve. Uh, let me see. Both, yeah, both my grandparents served, and uh, my one of my uncles served. Uh, but for me, it was just uh, something that I just decided for. I just wanted to have an adventure, so I did. All right. That's great. That's great. Well, you know, we're recording this on Saturday. Veterans Day is in in two days, and so it seemed like a great time uh, and a great opportunity to talk about, you know, some of the financial benefits that veterans receive. And I know on the military wallet, you've uh, you've written a lot of content that's helped a lot of people uh, understand what those benefits are and how they can take advantage of them. And um, you know, you were kind enough to send me over sort of a list. Of, of some of the more significant benefits, and including some that, you know, maybe some folks don't know about. And uh, so I thought we'd kind of go down that list, and um, we'll start with uh, a couple that, as, as you've pointed out uh, before, that uh, most people are probably very familiar with. And the first of those is the GI Bill. Um, can you tell us how that works? Yeah, the, the GI Bill is a, an education benefit that's offered to all military members when they join the service. It actually started back around World War II when there were literally millions of GIs who had come home and the country didn't know what to do with everybody. So they wanted to get these people trained, you know, not only with the technical skills that they had from the military, but get them trained in, in educational opportunities so that they could go lead companies and corporations, uh, teach other people become engineers, all of that. And the GI Bill has been one of the most cherished and defended benefits that military members have had access to. Um, so there's there's two primary versions of the GI Bill that are available right now. There's the Montgomery GI Bill, which you have to sign up for when you join, and you have to actually pay $100 a month uh, for a one year for a total of $1,200. And when you buy into that, you get 36 months of college education when you leave the service. You can use it while you're in the service, but all services have a tuition assistance benefit available. So it's generally better to exhaust those opportunities before you touch your GI Bill. Um, then once you start going to school on the under the Montgomery GI Bill, um, I'd, I'd have to look at the current rates, but it's around fifteen hundred dollars a month if you're going full time, and that's pretty substantial. It might not cover all schools, but it will do really well for state schools, uh, community college, those kinds of things. And you said so, that benefit lasts thirty six months for thirty six months. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, but you know that's going full time, and there's there's ways you can make it work a little longer. Um, there's also many. There are many schools and uh, colleges, universities that will give certain credit for military service. So a lot of times people can leave the military and not need to get your traditional 120 credit hours to get their bachelor's degree. They might need, you know, 100, 110, might be a little less. It really depends on which school they're going to and their military experience. So, uh, Ryan, on the Montgomery GI Bill, do, do folks in the National Guard and the Reserves have access to that? The National Guard and Reserves have a, a different form of the GI Bill, and the reason for that is because when you join the Guard or the Reserves, you join on a part-time basis. A typical Guard member or Reservist will serve one weekend a month or two weeks a year. So the way that they have it set up is they will typically earn a partial GI Bill payment based on um, how long they're serving and depending on if they're called to active duty or if they serve a certain amount of time, perhaps even if they served active duty before they went in the Guard of the Reserve, then they may have access to a higher benefit. Okay. 
Well, and if someone, when, uh, when someone wants to use the benefit, um, are they restricted in terms of what schools they can attend? The schools have to be accredited, um, that, and that's typically the the number one requirement. Okay. Uh, but what other people are going to be looking for, what the students are going to be looking for, is you know, is it going to meet their educational needs, and you know, can they afford it, and you know, many other factors. But there are a variety of schools that are willing to work with uh, either current or former military members, uh, either by giving them grants or sometimes the the acceptance, you know, getting accepted into the school may be a little easier or certain uh, factors may be waived when they're applying to the school. Um, scholarships may be available. And there are some schools um, – especially when you're using the other GI Bill, which we'll, we'll talk about, where they will actually give you the tuition for the rate of the GI Bill tuition and not charge you anything above that. Okay. And how do you, you know, if someone were looking for schools that, that, that offered that benefit, is there an easy way to find a list or is it just, you know, go, you know, talking to the schools directly that you're interested in and finding out? You can do both. So the, it's a good transition into the, the second type of GI Bill benefit, which is called the post-9-11 GI Bill. Some people call it the GI Bill 2.0. That program was uh, designed for people who served after the September 11th attacks. Uh, what happened was there were tens of thousands of military members who were required to stay on duty longer than they had initially signed on for. And as soon as they were released from duty, they were basically sent back into the economy. They were done. They were out of the military. They didn't have much transition time. And, you know, many of these people had just been at war for a year. They didn't know what to do. And they were finding that the GI Bill wasn't enough to help them get through school. So Congress passed a new bill that's called the post 9-11 GI Bill, which actually has a a greater or a more valuable benefit than the Montgomery GI Bill. And to qualify for that, you had to serve a certain amount of time after September 11th of 2001. And that's up to current members of the military as well. And you do have to serve a minimum requirement before you're eligible for that. The difference on this is with the post 9-11 GI Bill is the VA will pay the school that you attend uh, not the person, but the school, up to the amount of tuition for the highest state uh, tuition for the highest state school within that state. So, if you go to a school in uh, you know California, whatever the highest state school tuition is, they will pay up to that mu- that amount for any school within the state of California. So, even if you go to a private school, they'll pay up to that that level. Okay, and, um, and then there's well, you you had asked about if there's a way to find out which schools will give you an extra benefit. Right. And so that's called the Yellow Ribbon Program. And there are schools which say, okay, uh, we're willing to work with the VA and work with veterans to you know, bring our tuition kind of in line. So the VA will actually pay a portion of the difference and the school will give a grant or a scholarship for the other portion of the difference. And there's nothing additional coming out of the veteran's pocket. So they're able to attend the school on just their normal GI Bill benefit. And, and is that version of the GI Bill uh, available just to folks who fu- who serve full time, or is that also available to National Guard and reservists? That's a somebody has to, to have served full time. Yeah, so, okay. but there are many um, guards members and reservists who were activated after September 11th. Sure. So there are many. Guard members and reservists who are eligible for the post nine eleven GI Bill. You know, just as a, as a complete aside for a moment, I was in New York a couple of weeks ago. Uh, my wife and I met very good good friends of ours, um, and uh, uh, the, a couple that we've known for a long time. And he's fighting um, some serious cancer. And uh, we went to the nine eleven memorial. Have you been there since they've opened up the uh, the fountains? No, I haven't. Uh, last time I was there was. Uh, probably 2005, okay. 2004 or five, I think yeah. was the last time I was there. It, it's just a wonderful, um, monument. And one of the things they had there is this, the survivor tree. There's a tree 
that I guess was planted uh, uh, near uh, the towers that survived. And they, as I understand the story, they actually removed the tree and nursed it back to health and, and planted it. It's right next to one of the, the fountains. Um, and actually, my friend uh, took his picture next to the tree. It was his, his way of saying, here are two survivors. Um, but it's a, it's a wonderful uh, memorial. To, to um, I was glad we had a chance to go. Anyway, I don't mean to sidetrack the conversation, but... Um, no, it's, a, it's a great story. I wish your friend uh, the best in his journey. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's a fighter. Um, okay, so um, the GI Bill, you've told us about the two. Those are the two primary types of GI Bills that are available. Yes. Okay. And um, any any sort of resources or tips or tricks in terms of using the GI Bill? Anything to watch out for? Any ways to? I know um, some get sort of some sort of tuition assistance while they're in the service. Is there um, anything you can share with us in terms of dealing with that versus the GI Bill, bill to get the most benefit that you can? Sure. Yeah, I have two or three great tips that will help people who are either. In the, in the service right now are people who are eligible for both GI Bills. So if you're in the service, it's almost always better to use tuition assistance from your branch of the service while you are in because that's a free benefit that you have and you won't be uh, using any of your GI Bill, which is a finite resource. That way when you separate from the service, you still have that as an option to use. The Montgomery GI Bill, that's the one you have to pay into it. Right. You pay $1,200 over the course of a year. That pays a cash benefit to to the recipient. So let's say I got out of the service. I, I paid into it. I'm eligible for it, and I get a full-ride scholarship somewhere. Well, if somebody's going to pay for my school, I can st uh, still use the GI Bill, the Montgomery GI Bill, and they send me cash, and I can use that to cover my housing or living expenses oh. or whatever it might be. That also works for – if you have employer tuition assistance, a very good friend of mine went and got his MBA and his employer paid for it. He's a veteran. He had the Montgomery GI Bill. So he was able to pocket that every month. Okay. So for him, it was, you know, he got a school paid for. It. He got a cash uh, benefit from the VA while he was doing it. And then he uh, negotiated a very nice raise when he, uh, he got his degree. So, you know, that's a great benefit. And that's, it's what it's designed for. So he paid into it. He did his service, and he got kind of a double bonus out of it. Okay. So it's, it sounds like, depending on your situation, there are different ways to use this benefit. Uh, yeah. And then there's also the post-9-11 GI Bill, which has its benefits as well. That one pays the money directly to the school, but it typically pays a higher benefit. It also pays a monthly housing allowance while you're in in school, and it pays a, a small book stipend every year that can help you cover books and, and fees. Um, for most people, if they don't have a scholarship or uh, employer tuition assistance that will allow them to pocket the Montgomery GI Bill, then the post-9-11 will give them a better benefit if they're eligible for, for both of them. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Um the next benefit I want to cover uh, is the VA loan. I think this is something that you've taken advantage of. Yeah, the VA loan is great. That um, also after – I want to say that one came out after World War II as well. Uh, it's just a way to help GIs purchase a home. And the, so the real benefit of it is the government will back your loan. So you can typically find it a little bit easier to be approved for a loan. You still have to have a good credit score. You still have to be able to prove that you have income. But banks know that the government is going to back it. So if anything happens, they're not too worried about it. Uh, the other benefit is you can buy a home with no money down. Um, now, that can be a good thing and a bad thing. As we saw in the markets you know, when they crashed in 2008, 2009, et cetera, that if you didn't have any equity, you could quickly be way underwater. But it does allow people that flexibility. So that's, that's a good benefit. Yeah. I mean, like today's market, you know, without the VA loan, I don't know of any sort of um, just commercial mortgage where, that you can get with no money down. I mean, there you, aren't too many now. Yeah, it used to you used to be able to find them back in the day, but but I think probably the VA loan is the only one 
at least that I'm aware of, like that. Um, how do the interest rates on a VA loan compare to you know the standard rates you know prevailing at any given time? Sure, great question. I've seen them fluctuate. Um, before I bought my home, and and my wife and I were looking, she had actually purchased one uh, before we were married, and this was good 10 years or so, the the VA loan was actually slightly higher than a conventional loan. But I've seen it turn the opposite now. And I think the reason was there's a little bit more paperwork involved. And I don't think some of the lenders might have been um, wanting to deal with that. And they were also – the VA is also a little bit more strict with how they do their um, – what do you call it, the assessments and, and all that. So uh, it was really easy to get a conventional loan, not quite as easy to get a VA loan. Now it's it's the opposite where they know that the, that the money is backed. So the VA loan is actually slightly lower than a conventional loan. When you said assessment, um, are you like thinking of an appraisal for the home or is there something uh, else that you have to go through? Appraisal. With okay. Yeah, the, the home appraisal. Okay. Um, and, and I assume you had to pay some amount of, uh, closing costs. There are the, with the GI bill, it's actually called a funding fee. Okay. And that's a, usually a, a one or two percentile. I, I have to look it up to be sure, but it's, it's based on a percentage of the price to the home and it's more or less a processing fee that goes back into the system. And, and they use that to help with the overhead. And if people do default on a home, that those fees go toward that. There are ways, however, to get that fee waived. If you have a service-connected disability with a, I believe it's a 10% rating or more, and service-connected disability is an, an injury or a disability that a service member incurred while they're on duty. If they have that service-connected disability, then they can get the funding fee waived. Okay. And you mentioned a 10% rating. What do you mean by that? The, the VA assessed assesses each disability with a percentile rating and it could range anywhere from zero percent which just means okay you have something that happened while you're in the service but it's not affecting your quality of life so that's a zero percent up to a hundred percent which is very close to you permanently disabled okay. uh, but there's everywhere in between so it could be you know you, you tweaked your knee or you had a major knee surgery you might get a 10 or 20 percent disability rating off of that. And that's just a, a wild example. But it could be anything from, you know, broken bones to surgeries to high blood pressure, you name it. And, and folks that have that then can ha get some additional benefits under the VA loan program. They can typically just get the the funding fee waived, okay. which is, you know, one, one or two percent of the 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 loan value. Is there a, is there a limit to the number of times you can take advantage of a VA loan? Yes and no. You can only have one VA loan open at a time. So if you know I'm a veteran, I have a house, it was purchased in my name under my VA loan. I can only buy it if I'm gonna live in it. I can't use a VA loan to buy a house that I'm gonna rent out. Okay. Um strictly to rent it out. So I can do that. And if I live in this house and I pay it off completely then I can go buy another one because I've satisfied that first VA loan. But if I'm going to sell this house, it has to be sold completely. I can't just pass the note over to someone else. It has to actually be completely sold and then that note paid off before I can use the VA loan again. Okay. But uh, there are some tricks or some things that investors can do. For example, you can buy up to a quadplex and as long as you buy it to live in one of the units, you can buy that and you can rent out the other one or two or three units depending on the size of the home that you buy. So I've actually known a couple of military members who have done that and they basically bought a rental property that they lived in for a few years. And then when they moved to their next duty station, uh, they would either refinance it under a conventional loan or they would you know, leave it like that, leave it under their VA loan. It really depends. Okay. All right. Um, anything else we should know about VA loans? Or we, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're a great deal for anybody who is looking to buy a house. 
always be sure to shop around because there are companies who really know what they're doing with the VA loan in terms of the required paperwork and helping you get it, get you through that process. And there are other companies that just want your money. So really shop around and, you know, get a good feel for who you're working with. Okay. And if, how would, um, and, and maybe you can send me some links and I can include them in the show notes, but you know, uh, how would someone find the kind of company that you think really knows what they're doing with VA loans versus someone who maybe a mortgage broker that doesn't have that, that much experience? Well, it, you can always ask the mortgage broker and they're, they're going to sell you what they have. Um, and if you just ask them point blank, you know, can you walk me through this process? Have you done it before? What's your experience? You can get a feel from that way. If you're already a member of a military financial institution, there are several major um, financial institutions that cater primarily to the military crowd, then they're awesome. I've, I've worked with several of them. And then you can also work with some of the other major uh, lenders out there, and they've, they have experience with it as well. Okay. But like someone like Navy Federal Credit Union is obviously going to know everything there is to know about VA loans. Absolutely. Navy Federal Credit Union, USAA, um, the PenFed or Pentagon Federal Credit Union, uh, Veterans United. Uh, those are four prime examples. Uh, bank of America and Chase both have military uh, branches for their banks. Uh, there are a lot of credit unions that are around bases that might serve anywhere from one to two or five different bases, you know, they're usually regional. So if you're working with any of those, they're, they're going to be awesome in helping you figure that out. Okay. And I'll leave uh, links to a lot of those in the show notes. Um, okay. The next benefit, uh, veterans healthcare. What can you tell us? How does that work? It's a great system or it's a great benefit. It's a, it's, it can be a complicated system. And, So when I mentioned the, the service-connected disability earlier, uh, what happens is when you get out of the military, you have to go through several different transition sections. And one of them, you fill out a post-military health assessment. And if you have any problems with your health, they'll set you up with an appointment to go visit the Veterans Health uh, Administration. And then you can go Get checked out and you can fill out a claim for disability compensation if you feel that you know one of the injuries or illnesses is going to be a permanent issue and they will review that case and they will give you an assessment there based on whatever they feel it might be. You know, we, we touched on that a little bit. And that system right now is very backlogged because there's just tens and tens of thousands of people who are separating every year. And with what we've had for the last 10 years in Iraq and Afghanistan and all throughout the Middle East, we've had a lot of people who have, you know, war injuries or um, people who just got injured while they were serving. So the system right now is very backlogged and it can take sometimes a year or even two years before cases are being resolved. Sometimes if it's straightforward, it can be a few months, but that's pretty rare. So that's kind of step one is filling out the post-service health assessment. And then from there, um, they'll get back to you and they'll say, okay, this is something that you was service-connected or this was not. And if it's a service-connected injury, then you can typically go to the VA health system to have that injury taken care of. So let's say I tweaked my knee while I was in the service. Then if they determine that it was a service-connected injury, then... I can go have that knee looked at and they're not going to charge me for it because it was service connected and they're taking care of me. I can also go get other health care there, but you know, depending on my situation, they may char charge me a copay or charge my insurance. It, it depends on kind of case by case basis. Okay. And, and this, you know, uh, probably a complicated question, but do you think the affordable care act will, will affect, veterans health care or are they going to be do you think they're two totally separate um uh health insurance programs that's a great question uh the va actually sent out letters to everyone um i want to say it was it was this summer not too long ago 
you know, one or two months ago, maybe three months ago. And basically, if you are in the veterans health care system, then you are covered as far as the Affordable Care Act goes. And by covered, you just have to have access to your health insurance. So in that sense, they are related. If I'm in the system, then I'm covered. But as far as having access, they're, they're, they're kind of two different things. But one satisfies the other. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, that, that, that's got to be a complicated issue. I mean, you know, as we all know, the Affordable Care Act has had its, has, has had its problems uh, in its implementation, and, and I suspect those problems um, will take some time to get resolved. Um, but but it, it's certainly the case, or I would I would assume it's the case that that the Affordable Care Act is is, is certainly not going to take any health care benefits away from veterans. No, at this point, it certainly should not. Uh, but that system is it's, – it's a massive system and it can be fairly complicated because literally eligibility for the VA healthcare system is on a one-by-one-by-one by one by one basis. Okay. So you know, if you and I both served together and we both got out at the same time, you might be eligible. You might not, but I might be or, or vice versa. It really just depends on the individual circumstances. Okay. Well, and I ask that question. It might might seem like a silly question. Why would the Affordable Care Act cause issues for veterans' health care? But you know, there's been a lot in the news about folks losing their health insurance, their their the the health insurance they had under the Affordable Care Act, and that's a whole other issue. And it's not specific to veterans, so we're not gonna we could spend a whole show on that issue. But um, it you know, in light of all that, it seemed like a fair question. Um, yeah, it's it it definitely is a fair question. But yeah, it's it, the. The Affordable Care Act by itself is it, it could have its own episode. <laughs> right, right, okay. Um, and then, so uh, kind of from healthcare, then there, there's also, I assume, compensation for veterans with disabilities. There is. Um, so I mentioned earlier about the example I gave is you know you tweak your knee and you might be eligible for you know a ten percent disability compensation, and the percentile rating has to do with you know the it sounds crass but the you know the quality of life the percentage of life that you have you know going forward it, the, se- the severity of your injury or your illness the severity of your injury if you will yeah okay and it, it, and again it can be a complicated system as far as how they determine what the actual ratings are and part of it is part of it is subjective part of it is not um they actually have thick manuals and that you you go through a health exam they you go through interviews with doctors it's a very lengthy process and then the doc, the doctor has to go off of all the information you've given him the information from your your prior medical records and um his his own assessment of where you are then he looks in in his book in his system and says okay medical records say this patients says this, I see this, book says this, here's the rating. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things going on. Now, you multiply that times, you know, someone who has two knee issues, a back issue, a wrist issue, uh, high blood pressure, and, you know, shake it all up and what do you get? It, it kind of gets complicated. And it's also a system where 10 plus 10 equals 20, but 10 plus 20 might not equal 30. And it's it's complicated the way they do it. So you start off at 100% and you add a 10% disability and you're at 90. You add another 10% disability and it's actually 10% off of the 90 that's remaining, not 10% from 100. So every time you, you stack one on top, it's kind of a diminished returns. So it's – like I said, it can be complicated. Okay, but they they I, they have a system obviously to assess the severity of the disability, and I take it that compensation that a veteran would be entitled to is based in at least in part on that assessment. It is yes, and uh, once you get that in the system, that that entitles you to health care for that specific item if it's uh, you know ten percent or higher. Um, and then you're also eligible for a monthly payment, disability compensation payment, which the VA automatically deposits into your account on the first of every month. Okay. Um, and the payment ranges, obviously, as you might think, that you know, something with a 10% compensation is 
um, much less than somebody who has, uh, say, 100% disability compensation. Okay, right. Um, okay, and, and the, the last benefit I want to cover, and this is something that I, I, you know, of course, I'm not a veteran. I didn't have the honor of serving, but um, uh, something that I, I don't know why it surprised me, but it did, and that is that, that veterans have benefits at the state and local level. Is that right? Yeah, it, it's – it's awesome that many states and uh, sometimes counties or localities will extend certain benefits to people. Um, sometimes it can be as simple as, uh, you know, the license plates that you see. Um, some, you know, you see military veteran. Some states actually don't charge for those. But they'll charge a reduced rate. You know, maybe it's half the price of the normal licensing fee every year. Um, it can also be homestead exemption on taxes. Uh, sometimes those are limited to people with a service-connected disability rating of a you know certain percentage or higher. Um, trying to think of some of the others. Obviously, employment is one. A lot of localities like to look for veterans. The federal government does as well. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to hire you because you're a veteran, but it can give you preference points and it can help you get hired to kind of push your resume up the stack a little bit. The thing with the state and local benefits is there really is no standard. Every state and locality is different. So um, what I recommend people do is they actually go to the state or their county website and almost every single one is going to have a veterans affairs or military section. And you can go on there and, and look at what you might be eligible for. Um, a lot of states all also offer reduced you know, driver's licenses or uh, hunting and fishing licenses. If you have military certifications, uh, for example, like a commercial driver's license or a CDL or certain um, teaching certificates or um, medical licensing or things like that, oftentimes they'll either waive the, the licensing or they'll allow you a kind of a grace period to, to allow you to get settled in before you have to um, renew your license or get the one within the state. Okay. And you think the best place for folks that are listening to find those kind of benefits would either be at their state or county websites where they live? Absolutely. Uh, most counties will also have a Veterans Affairs office where you can walk in and and talk to them and they'll sit down and walk you through the process and let you know what, what you might be eligible for. So, you know, your, your county, um, uh, trying to think of what would be the, uh, the law is where they have the courts oftentimes right. or, you know, every county is a little different. Right. Okay. Well, and, and I guess that raises another question, you know, obviously the, the site that you run, the military wallet.com is, is a wealth of resources and um, I'll, I'll certainly include a link to that site, to your site, in the show notes. But are there are there other um, resources or places where veterans can go, you know, to learn about you know the, the benefits that they have both at the federal level and at the state and local level? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, VA.gov, VeteransAffairs.gov, is a massive website that just has an enormous wealth of information. You can start clicking on there and read all day long and find all kinds of programs that uh, you might be eligible for. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, if I can just cut in for a second, I, I, as you mentioned that I went to the VA website and, and mm -hmm. on the home screen you do, you see, you know, like healthcare, they have all kinds of information on the healthcare benefits they have uh, information on education and training, the home loans, the VA loan that you talked about, I guess there's a life insurance benefit. Uh, there is. Yep. Um, so, okay. So the VA.gov, any others? Yeah, the, the VA.gov is where I recommend everybody start just because you're getting the information from, uh, the source, but that doesn't necessarily help you, uh, see exactly what you're eligible for. You have to kind of wade through the information yourself. So if you need assistance, what I recommend people do is they go to their state or their county veterans affairs office. A lot of times they'll have employees there who are quite frequently veterans themselves, but people who are, are, know the system inside and out. And they can often help not only with the, the local benefits, but they can often help with federal or point you in the right direction. 
Okay. Uh, the other thing I recommend is veteran service organizations. And those include like the, the VFW, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, American Legion, um, DAV, Disabled American Veterans, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, Veterans of America. They've, they're a, a newer organization and they're doing some phenomenal things. Every one of those organizations has caseworkers who will help you from start to finish with your claim and they don't charge you a dime for it. So I always recommend people go to those organizations, those types of organizations. There are many others, but start with that type of an organization. And, you know, somebody's going to say, we're going to charge you to do this. Try one of these other organizations first, because they're not going to charge you unless it's, you know, a legal matter, but they might refer you to, to someone, but okay. always, always start there. Great. Great. Well, again, I'll, I'll leave links to those in the show notes. Um, uh, I guess one last thing, and I appreciate your time. Uh, I noticed on your site you have uh, an article about Veterans Day free meals and discounts. And I was scrolling through this this article, and it's like, I don't know, two, three, four pages of uh, restaurants and other companies that offer veterans um, you know, great discounts or, as you said, free meals uh, on Veterans Day. How, how did you come up with this list? It's a labor of love. <laughs> <laughs> um, it started off when, um, you know, I never thought about any of that when I was in the service. Um, for me, being part of the military was just who I was and what I did. And every year I would see this massive line outside of Golden Corral. I mean, like literally wrapped around the, the building. And, you know, I talked to my, my friends. I was like, what's that? And they said, you don't know that, you know, they've been doing this for like five or six years. They, you know they they give a free meal on Veterans Day. I said, well, hey, that's cool. And it's uh, eligible, anybody who has ever served, if they're currently serving, whatever. And they also donate a ton of money to to charities during that, that day. They do, they were one of the first big restaurants to do that. And then I started learning about more and more of them. And what I did is I just started putting them on my site. And as I did, the page became more popular. And then restaurants started contacting me. At first, I just listed some of the major national chains. But now I try to list uh, regional chains as well, even some of the smaller uh, one, two, three restaurant places. Um, and then lots of stores are offering discounts. I want to get the, the information out to all the veterans because these companies are doing something very nice just to say thanks for the service that they've done. And it's a great way to help promote these businesses as well because they're going to get a lot of traffic. And it's just, it's just such a, a wonderful event, and it's, it's fun to be a part of it. Well, it's a, it's a great list. Uh, as I said, I'm looking at it now. It's three pages uh, uh, long, and uh, I'll certainly include it in the show notes, but folks can go to themilitarywallet.com and they'll see it. And uh, it, it gives folks an opportunity to find uh, places to go on Veterans Day. Um, so, well, Ryan, listen, I really appreciate your time um, and uh, the information you've provided. The benefits that we provide our veterans are important, and it's important that they understand what, what's available. Um, and so I, I really appreciate it. Ryan mentioned a number of resources in today's uh, interview. And uh, you can find all, all of those resources, links to those websites, uh, concerning veterans' benefits uh, at, at the show notes uh, for this episode, which you can find at doroller.net forward slash podcast one. That's podcast followed by the number one. Well, that wraps up our first show. You know, if you have any questions about uh, benefits for veterans, uh, please send me an email. You can email me at dr at doroller.net. I'll be happy to pass the, the question on to, to um to Ryan and uh, get an answer back to you. I answer every email I receive, so feel free to email me anytime about anything. Um, and if you haven't signed up for our, uh, my newsletter, you can do so at doughroller.net forward slash newsletter. That'll take you to the sign-up page. It's simple and easy. It's free. Uh, and I, I, I try to pack my newsletter with great information every week. You get one a newsletter every weekend. Uh, I don't try to bombard your email, uh, your inbox with uh, a ton of email, although you can sign up for a daily option as well if you'd like. And uh, so that's a wrap. Until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.